Well, welcome uh, to the series that we're in. We're talking about uh, a healthy family. We started talking about this last week. And last week, we talked about the foundation for building a healthy family. And, of course, we learned that the foundation is built on worship, your relationship with God. You cannot have a healthy home. You cannot have a healthy life. You cannot have a complete life unless you have a relationship with God unless you worship God. So that's what we saw was the foundation. Today, we're going to continue this series, and we're going to talk about a healthy marriage, a healthy marriage. Now, notice I said a healthy marriage, not a perfect marriage. If you have two imperfect people that come together and live with each other, it is impossible, if you've got two imperfect people, to have a perfect marriage, okay? But you can have a blessed marriage, okay? You can have a Christian marriage, and you can be honored by God. And so uh, we're talking about how does Scripture show us uh, to have the kind of marriage, no matter if you've been married for just a minute or if you've been married for over 50 years, God wants you to be able to have a healthy marriage. Now, um, I heard about a woman that was filing for divorce, and her attorney looked at her. He had known her for a long time. He said, I thought you took your husband for better or worse. She goes, yeah, but he was a whole lot worse than what I took him for, all right? <laughs> and so a lot of people don't understand, maybe, that uh, sometimes it's difficult when you get married. Um, when you have two imperfect people, it's not always going to be easy. My, mother, uh, my mother's parents, my grandparents on my mother's side, uh, were named Wendell and Dorothy Phillips. And uh, it was interesting. They met um, when she was 14 years old. Uh, they met. She was, work, she was one of 11 children that survived. And so she was working at this boarding house and my grandpa was probably, I don't know, 17, 18 years old at the time. And uh, he came in on a Monday night after work, and she was working there, and she was serving food. That was the very first time they ever met, okay? She was 14, he was 17 or 18, and uh, they met on a Monday night, all right? That Friday, they got married. <laughs> they got married on that Friday night. Now, I got to be honest with you. Um, I, I don't recommend that, all right? That is probably a little quick. And uh, I would say that uh, in our culture today, uh, you might go to prison if you marry a 14-year-old, okay? But the fact is, they had a blessed marriage, okay? Uh, they were married for over 52 years, all right? And uh, my grandpa, as he got older, he had some health issues, and uh, he had several heart attacks. And the first time he had a heart attack, um, they were in the emergency room, and the doctors actually shocked him back to life, okay? And my grandmother was a hysterical woman. She would go crazy over little things that would go wrong. She was a wonderful Christian woman, but she was really afraid of a lot of things. And uh, I'll never forget that she was there, and he had literally had died and was shocked back to life. And my grandmother was like, oh, my goodness. She goes, oh, did you die? And did you, did you see a light? And my grandpa, even in that state, was a very funny person, okay? He goes, well, he said, I, I thought I saw the devil. She goes, oh, no, you saw the devil. He goes, and I woke up and it was just you. <laughs> now, they did not have a perfect marriage, but they did have a healthy marriage. And I want to tell you that what they did was put God first. And this is how you have a healthy marriage. Read with me in Proverbs 24, verse 3. 
It takes wisdom to have a good family. It takes understanding to make it strong. God says you got to have wisdom. And how do you get wisdom? Well, Scripture shows us how to get wisdom. He said you got to have understanding. If you're going to have a strong family, you've got to have wisdom and you got to have understanding. Well, in Proverbs, we learn how to have God's wisdom. And wisdom is simply this. Maybe you want to write this down. Wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. That's all it is. Seeing life from God's point of view. Now, notice he said you need wisdom and knowledge. Now, there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. I heard someone define it this way. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is actually a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put potatoes in fruit salad, all right? So th there's a difference, you see. And so God says we've got to have wisdom and knowledge. So we've got to, we've got to work at it. We've got to discover what's worked. But there's a, a crowning thing that you must have, and that is wisdom. What is wisdom? Well, the Bible tells us in Proverbs that wisdom is really... Uh, defined by looking at life from God's point of view, and it really is, ultimately, it's mostly defined by uh, obeying God. That's wisdom. Now, in Proverbs, it shows us the definition of a fool or a foolish person. It, it shows us that uh, a fool is defined as an inexperienced person in some cases, okay? Now, yeah, that just simply means that you don't have life experience. Uh, some of you have teenagers, and uh, you probably should tell them to run for president now while they still know everything, all right? But when you are young and inexperienced, okay, uh, that would be what one of the definitions of foolish is in the Bible. And you can get wisdom either God's way if you're young and foolish, okay, young and inexperienced, you either get wisdom by listening to God or the hard way. Now, nobody likes getting wisdom the hard way, okay? The hard way is through the rough knocks, the tough breaks of life. That's how you get wisdom that way, okay? Or you can follow Scripture. You can uh, do what the Bible says, so there's a very stark contrast that God gives between wisdom and foolishness that will help inform us of how to have uh, a healthy marriage. Read with me in Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6. Now I'm going to read from three different translations just to show you the depth of what this means. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 from the English Standard Version says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. All your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. In other words, he'll make your way smooth. He'll make it clear. He'll make it obvious what you should do. So trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Now, let's read it from the Good News Translation. I love how this reads. Listen to what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Same in the beginning there. Never rely on what you think you know. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? You think you know some things. Now, hopefully you do know some things. But what it's talking about here is that our own stubborn ways of what we think we know. We know better than God. You ever, you ever just tried to lecture God? You, you ever try to inform Him of what He should do? That, that's a funny thing. I imagine God gets a kick out of that. But He says, remember the Lord in everything you do, and He will show you the right way. So you want the right way? You want to live in a way that's blessed, a way that's healthy, a way that's full of wisdom, a, a way that God honors, 
well, then don't just trust what you think you know. And boy, don't we do that a lot? We just think we know best. We think we know better. And then I will read verses 4 to 6, not just 5 and 6, from the Living Bible. It says, if you want favor with both God and man, and a good reputation for common sense, then trust the Lord completely. Sometimes it's hard to trust the Lord completely, isn't it? I mean, we trust Him with what we see, we trust Him with what we have experienced, but then when it comes down to the difficult things in life, what happens? We, we sometimes don't trust Him. We sometimes think we know best. He says, um, in everything you do, put God first. He said, then trust the Lord completely. Don't ever trust yourself. <laughs> you see, in the English standard, it's like, you know, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. In, in the Good News translation, I love this. Uh, it's like, don't rely on what you think you know. And then the Living Bible is like, uh, don't, in everything you do, don't ever trust yourself. Don't ever trust yourself. You get the idea that we need to trust God, okay? So, the wisdom that he's talking about here, I want to just help you understand this. Uh, it has three views, okay? Um, three definitions, if you will. Three descriptions of wisdom in this passage and uh, in the book of Proverbs. The first view, it means this. It means to have skill in war. So that's the way wisdom is defined. In other words, you've got skill in war. That person is wise because he's got skill in war. Now, I find it interesting that the Bible does describe the Christian life as a war. It says in Ephesians, we are to put on the whole armor of God. It tells us that we're in a battle. And so uh, you need wisdom how to live this successful life in this battle called the Christian life. Another definition, a second way to define wisdom is simply this, wisdom in everyday life. In other words, common sense. Have you noticed that common sense is one of the most least common things in the world? But this is what the Bible shows us that sometimes if you, let me rephrase that, if you want God's wisdom in common, everyday things, you need to follow the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need to study. That doesn't mean that, oh, I trust the Lord, and therefore I'm not going to read the instructions when I, it says some assembly required, all right? That's not what it means, okay? But you can have common sense in relationships, in work, in family, and in your everyday living. By the way, if you want to see an example of someone that had this in the Bible, in uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 1, you remember Daniel, the guy that got thrown in the lion's den, okay? He was one of the most incredible leaders in the Bible. And listen to what it said about Daniel. When he was a young man, listen to what it says. And Daniel was skillful in all wisdom. He was most likely a teenager, a teenager when this was written about him. Now, that would be uncommon indeed, would it not? Okay. A teenager having wisdom. He said he was endowed with knowledge and understanding learning. In other words, he knew what to listen to, what to hear, what to follow. He understood learning and he was competent to stand in the king's palace. Now, God shows us that one aspect of wisdom is simply knowing what to do, having common sense. And it's not just common sense that depends on human intelligence, but rather it depends on God. And I want you to get this because uh, this is foundational for understanding what we're talking about today. If you are going to have wisdom in your marriage, you got to know the right thing and the wrong thing to do. And God will give you this wisdom if you'll trust Him, not trust yourself, but trust in God. Let me just kind of illustrate this. Um, Kim and I have been married for 38 years, and I 
made a pact with Kim and with myself and with all the churches I've worked at uh, when we got married that I would never do a couple things. That I would never be alone with another woman who's not part of my family and who is not my wife, that I would never be alone. In other words, I would not counsel a woman behind closed doors. I would not go out to lunch with a woman by herself. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there anything wrong, is there anything sinful about eating lunch with a woman that's not your wife? Of course not. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, Is there anything wrong with counseling a woman with the Word of God who is not your wife? No. There's nothing wrong. But you know what I learned a long time ago? The fact is, if I'm going to have the wisdom that God gives, and I'm going to protect my marriage, I must do things that are probably radical in some people's eyes. Okay? And so, that is the kind of wisdom that God gives. All right? And then the third definition of wisdom is simply your relationship with God. So get, get this picture, okay? He says, when you get wisdom, uh, he's going to give you experience, all right? You're going to know what to do. You're going to have common sense. Uh, you're going to learn how to navigate difficult times in life, all right? He says that you're going to have uh, wisdom in your relationship with God that he is going to give you skill like a soldier, skill like a warrior. Remember in Psalm 127 that the Bible says children are a gift from the Lord and like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. This idea that as a parent, you're to be a warrior. You're to develop skill. In the same way, God wants us in our relationship with Him, in our common sense, and in understanding that we are in a war. We are in a battle. He wants you to be able to protect your marriage. Now, the passage we're going to read today um, is from Proverbs chapter 2. And Solomon in this gives two Interesting examples. Uh, The first example, he's talking about the right kind of man. What a man should do. What a man should be. And in the second example, he talks about the right kind of woman. Uh, And In fact, uh, in the first part, he talks about how a godly man should live and how you should avoid living an ungodly life. And in the second part, he talks about how a godly woman should live and the choices and decisions that she should make and then how that the man is to make this decision, this choice in his interaction with the woman. So, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. My son, Solomon's talking to his son. He said, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures. All right, he's got the setup here. He said, you really want to have wisdom. You got to have a little effort. You got to pay attention. He says, if you want that, then... Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Remember last week we talked about the fear of the Lord being worshiping God. It's about your relationship with God. So he says, if you want the right relationship with God, if you want to understand how you are to live, to know right from wrong, to know wise choices from foolish choices, he said, you got to have wisdom and God will give you this wisdom and then you're going to make the right decisions. He says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God for the Lord gives wisdom. Now, I want you to let that sink in. Now, he's not suggesting that you should never talk to another believer or if you need counseling that you never should talk to a counselor. 
Um, but I'm afraid that there are a lot of people that are more interested in gossip than they are wisdom. Okay? I mean, let, let, let me help you. Uh, if you have a friend uh, that is just simply, uh, you know, that, that they want you to be as miserable as they are, don't go to that person for wisdom. Okay? The, the truth is, um, we are to get wisdom from God. So when it comes to wisdom in your marriage, this is the application here, the Lord gives wisdom. Now, once again, should you get counseling? Yes. That's a wonderful thing. Do you need people that are friends that will help you? Yes. But understand this. The ultimate giver of wisdom is not a marriage counselor. The ultimate giver of wisdom is God. And the Word of God. Now, once again, the reason that we must read Scripture and listen to preaching is so that we can understand what God's wisdom really is. So the Lord gives wisdom, He says, For from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of His saints. And then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. By the way, you get those things down, you're going to have a pretty good marriage. Okay? You know what to do, what not to do, righteousness. You know how to be fair and just. You know um, how to treat each other as equals. You know how to take the right path, the right decision, the right way. By the way, um, there is a right and wrong way. Not sinful and righteous, but a right or wrong way to approach your spouse. My wife thankfully, uh, understands the best way. We've been together a long time now. She understands the best way to handle me, okay? And I don't mean like handle me, like manipulate me. But she knows what my hot buttons are, and I know what hers are, okay? And, And what she has learned is she has learned how to treat me in a way that is going to help me respond. Now, to be honest, because we're both imperfect people, she also knows how to trip my switch, all right? So, uh, and, and you all know that. But here's the point. God says that when you begin to follow his way, he is going to give you wisdom. He said, uh, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil from men of perverted speech who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. So he's describing the right and the wrong kind of man there. Then he goes on to describe the right and wrong kind of woman. So he says to his young son, he says, so you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, for who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed, none who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. Let me just give you three thoughts on building a healthy marriage. Three things you can do that we learn from this passage of Scripture. Number one, you got to learn to fight for your marriage. Nobody else is going to fight for you. You got to fight for your own marriage. Okay? So when he talks about this wisdom and the idea of it being like a warrior, I want you to notice some of the words that he uses seeking, guarding, shielding. Watching and delivering. That shows us that we've got to fight for our marriage. Don't be afraid to fight for your marriage. Why? Because marriage takes effort. 
Now, I know it, it, you know, we like, all like fairy tales, and we all like happily ever after. I love stories. I love movies. I love books. But, you know, if you're not careful, you'll get caught up in the fairy tale and forget to live the reality. And so, in reality, you've got to fight for your marriage. It takes the grace of God. It requires effort. Now, what do you fight for? Well, in this passage, you've got to fight for the marriage covenant. It said there that, um, that uh, she would uh, forsake the covenant of her God. God wants you to fight for the marriage covenant. You've got to fight to keep it right. You got to fight for it. That's what he's saying. Number two, you got to fight to guard or protect your marriage. That's what we see in this passage. Notice how, in, in case with the woman, you got the man and the woman he talked about, but notice how the woman treated the man and tricked him. Okay? Notice. You know, most of us, we say, well, it's through the look. She was like deceptive and she was looking all sexy and, and all this. And the guy, he got distracted. He didn't have his guard up and they fell into sin. No, that's not the way it works. Not according to scripture. It's notice that it was her words. Her words. And I'm not saying that... Um, you know, if you're flirta flirtatious in your dress or how you do, that that's not a problem. I'm not suggesting that. But understand this. The way that a, an affair begins is through what you hear. It's the words. It's, oh, honey, you look so good and I can't, man, my wife, she doesn't treat me like that. You are, you treat me so good. Oh, baby, you just don't understand. My ex-husband, you know, he was just so mean. And he was never, you are so sweet. It begins with the smooth words. So we got to fight to guard our marriage. We got to fight to protect it. This is how to affair-proof your marriage. Guard your words. Guard your ears. Yes, you should guard your eyes, yes. But you better learn to guard these ears. Because we all like to hear nice things. We all like to hear deceptive things. We all like to hear compliments. And I'm not suggesting that you should not be complimentary of other people. But I am saying that you better watch how you listen to other people. Uh, number two, you got to learn how to get along with each other. That's the wisdom in life part. So you got to fight for your marriage. And then in marriage, you got to learn how to get along with each other. Notice the words again. Insight, understanding, righteousness, justice, equity, discretion. Don't use perverted speech. You got to learn how to get along. And by the way, and you know, and, and I've, um, I've actually written a book uh, on marriage. It's called Marriage in the Nude, and many of you have read it. And uh, it's just based on scripture of what, how we're to live in a godly relationship with one another. Um. But I, I've kind of learned since I wrote that book that there is really not as... I don't think we need... Let me say it this way, without, hopefully without offending anybody. I don't think men need to be told to get in touch with their feelings. I was expecting an amen there. But obviously, you're henpecked, and you are afraid to say amen because you think your wife is going to get on to you afterwards. No, no, let me, let me say this. I don't believe that men, we need to be reminded, yes, okay? We need to be reminded of that we have a woman that God has given us and how to talk to, I get that, okay? But let, me, let me tell you what you didn't have a problem with before you got married 
you did not have a problem communicating. Am I, am I lying? Okay. I mean, oh, baby, you just look so good. Oh, I'm going to put you on a plate and sop you up with a biscuit. You look so good. <laughs> you didn't have a problem communicating with your woman. Okay. And, and yes, maybe you didn't use as many words as she does. And maybe you don't understand why she talks so much and why she wants to talk about everything in the world and talk it to death. I get that, especially when you're watching a football game. Okay, but I'm just saying, you didn't have a problem communicating. You didn't. Now, what you may have forgotten is the importance of communicating with each other. Okay? Uh, Women, you did not have... I know that, you know, you have a hard time understanding your man, okay? Uh, I understand that, okay? And that's normal and natural. I mean, the fact is, you thought that you married Prince Charming. And after you got married, you discovered all you have is a couch that burps. That's all you've got, okay? And I get it, okay? You, you're like, oh my goodness, what is going on? Um, at, but you know what? The, the truth is, you didn't have a problem before you got married communicating respect and building up. And, and though you may not have understood the why or the reasons why he did what he does, or you may not have understood, you still don't understand why he's so sloppy or, or, or whatever, okay? But my point is this. You've got to learn how to get along with each other. That's wisdom in life, okay? And it's not like you really don't understand how. Because you did at one point, probably wouldn't be married if you didn't, okay? So you got to learn how to get along with each other, and this is a biblical thing. And then finally, and this is the most important part, you got to put God at the center of your marriage. You want a successful marriage? Put God in the middle. Now, does that mean that every person that goes, every married person that goes to church never gets a divorce? Unfortunately, no, that does not mean that. But I tell you this, you want a successful, blessed marriage. If you put God at the center of your life, you got a whole lot better shot than the person that doesn't. You know the statistics. It's actually more than one out of two marriages ends in divorce now. But you know what the numbers are? Now, get, hear what I'm saying, Okay. It's not just the people that go to church. It's the people that go to church and serve. In other words, church is a priority in their life. Worshiping God is a priority in their life. And they're involved. So, you don't go to church or you just go occasionally or whatever. You got a one in two shot, actually less than that, of making it. Over 50% chance you're going to end up in divorce. You know what the statistics say? For people, a husband and wife, that go to church together, that serve God, that volunteer, that are, in other words, they're totally involved. You know what the chances of them getting divorced is? One in 1,105. Now, I don't know about you, I'm no math wizard, but I think that one's a better chance, okay? In other words, I got a shot of 1 in 1,105 of getting a divorce, or I've got a shot greater than 1 in 2. And the point is this, when you put God at the center of your marriage, God blesses you. He gives you wisdom. Statistics Prove it out, not that we depend on statistics, but I'm simply saying that God, when He is at the center of your marriage, gives you wisdom. Wisdom. So how do you do that? What's the practical side of that? Well, let me just give you a couple things and we're done. You got to go to church together. You want God at the center? Go to church together. Serve together. This is important because it's not just the people that go to church 
but it's the people that go to church and serve. In other words, they're involved, okay? We say things like participation is membership. Do you know why we say all the silly things that we say around here? Your next step's your most important step. Um, Generous people are happy people. We're better together. You know why we say these things? Because the Bible says these things. And in case you're wondering, I think God's got a better understanding of what makes your life successful than you and I do. Remember, in all your ways acknowledge Him. In all your ways acknowledge Him. Don't depend on what you think you know. Oh, I know better. Do you? Do you? I don't think you do. Go to church together, serve together, give together, read the Bible and pray together, invest in Christian fellowship together. This is important, Uh, small groups and serving and so forth. And then I will say this, bring your family with you. You got kids? Bring them. You got grandkids? Put up with them spending the night with you so you can bring them to church on Sunday. He said, oh, that's a lot to ask. I understand it, okay. Uh, You know, my mom and dad, they love our children. And I asked them about it one time, and my mom told me, she said, well, I think we love our grandkids, your kids, twice as much as we loved you. And I said, well, thank you very much for that. She goes, no, you don't understand. We love it when they come, and then we love it when they leave. Stand. And Lord, I know that often uh, our heart desires companionship so much. But Lord, help them not to be in a rush. Help them not to think that a, a, a spouse, a husband, or a wife is what is necessary to define them. Help them to realize they get their identity in you. But Lord, give them the patience. Give them the person that you want in their life. And help them to make a commitment to serve God together. And then, Lord, I pray that you just bless our homes. Thank you for every Christian home we have. Thank you for every husband and wife. Thank you for every parent. Thank you for every one of our children. God, I pray that you bless us and help us to fight for our marriage, for our home. Help us to increase in practical wisdom. But Lord, most important, let us put you at the center of our home. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let me encourage you now today. If you are here or you're watching online and you've not received Christ, 
Maybe you don't even know what that is. Maybe you have not been in church, at least not enough to understand what we're talking about. We're talking about asking God to forgive you, and not just that, to come into your life and to change you, to admit that you need Him, to admit to God that you cannot live a perfect life. You cannot live a life without sin. You need help. And when you turn to Him, that He will help you. And so today, if you'd like to just say a simple prayer to say, Lord, I want you at the center of my life. I want you to save me. Um, Then you may pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to forgive me and to save me. I need you, Lord. I'm asking you to come into my life right now. If you'd like to pray that prayer, you can say it in your seat. You can come see one of our prayer team members at the end of the service. They'll be here to help you. You can pray about that or any other thing. You can pray about your health or a family member or finances or your job. It doesn't matter what it is. You come and someone will pray for you and they'll pray with you. And so I hope you will um, remember that. All right. Remember now, if you want to help with the hurricane relief, you can do so by giving uh, online and marking it as hope. You can give at stillwaters.online. You can give at 84321. You can give on the Church Center app, or you can give right now as the buckets are passed. Ushers, you come, and let's uh, pass those at this time. And uh, at this time, we will remember, put your next step card in, and uh, we'll have this record of your being here today, okay? All right. We'll give you just a second. Once again, about 95% of our giving now comes in digitally, either online or through text or through the app. Um, But we are very thankful for every one of you who gives, for every one of you who is faithful. Uh, We could not do this without you. And oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. We did close this past Tuesday on this building. So, praise God. Praise God. Don't forget, we're going to be talking about this Uh, This year for the Miracle Offering, for those of you who are new to our church, you may not know what the Miracle Offering is. It's our offering at the end of the year. We do it during the month of December, and it's our best offering of the year. Um, We, it's our best effort, okay? And uh, this is a way for you to be generous. This is a way for you to make a difference. And what we're asking this year is that you give and you mark it as Miracle Offering like normal, but we're going to designate this toward uh, this building. The sooner we pay this building off, we got 0% interest. 0% interest. That, that's unheard of, okay? Uh, I've, in fact, I've never heard of anybody on a commercial property uh, getting that. That's just a God thing. It's a miracle. So the more we pay toward this, the less we have to pay. So uh, we've got that for five years. And then at the end of that time, whatever we owe, which if we don't make an extra penny of payment, we're going to owe less than $700,000 on $1.5 million. We'll owe about $675,000 in five years. And then we'll refinance that, okay? But wouldn't it be awesome if we paid it all off in that time and didn't have to pay a single penny of interest? I think that would be awesome, okay? So whatever you feel led to give, we don't do pressure on giving here. If you feel led to give, God will show you, okay? If you don't feel led to give, keep your money in your pocket. Just pray about it, okay? And I believe God will show you, all right? So, uh, anyway, that's my spiel on that. So, we'll be taking that in December. The first Sunday of December is our miracle offering, but of course, you can give at any time uh, toward that, and uh, so you can give Uh, that will help us offset all of that, okay? 
All right. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for being here today. We'll see you next.